I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our speaker for today. Professor Shiva Priya did a PhD in organic chemistry from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, under the supervision of Professor S. Chandrasekhar, and did her postdoctoral fellowships from Harvard Medical School and Whitehead Institute, MIT. She is currently the associate professor and Kaku Bain Bakshiram Gelod Chair in the, uh, in the Department of Chemistry at the Indian Institute of Technology, Gandhinagar. She is the current Dean of Students at IIT Gandhinagar. She has also co-authored more than 50 publications, book chapters, and has eight US and 14 Indian patents to her credit. She is a recipient of the prestigious PST Ramanuj Fellowship, and she was also featured as the top 25 scientist from in India in a book titled India Science Geniuses in 2022. She is also a recipient of multiple different awards. Our current areas of interest include targeted drug discovery and medicinal chemistry. At IIT Gandhinagar, her lab focuses on studying mechanistic pathways of DDR kinases using small molecules to develop novel therapeutics, as well as exploring helobacter pyroli survival pathways for developing drugs against infection. Her long-term goal would be to make affordable medicines for cancer. Thank you, Professor Shivapriya, for joining us. The stage is all yours. Yes, for about another 40, 45 minutes, I would be talking the challenges as well as how potential is this particular class of proteins that those are called kinases. Um, so I'll be talking about the introduction of these uh, kinases and the success stories towards this drug discovery of for this kinases. Um, towards the end, I will be talking about what are we doing in our lab for the last 10 years or so at IIT Gandhinagar. So kinases is a brief introduction. As you can see in this cartoon, is a small protein or a bigger protein, which actually takes a uh, let me take my which takes a small portion from ATP, which is a phosphate group, and then puts on to another molecule or a kinase. It could be another substrate, and then phosphates this substrate. The substrate could be a kinase or a, a regular protein. So this is a very small reaction that happens very rapidly in the body. It's a cascade of reactions that triggers a lot of cellular signaling in the cell. Okay, but this reaction is very, very difficult to do it in the lab in, the, in a RB, like a chemist. I'm a chemist, so if I have to do this reaction, it's, it's not so easy. But kinases do this very, very easily. And as I told you, these are the class of proteins or enzymes that catalyzes the transfer of a phosphate group from ATP to a specific protein. And there are about 500 kinases in human kinome, which makes it a large uh, protein body um, in our cell signaling. So this cell signaling is very important because it's like a rapid uh, process that happens. So if you see, this is a kinome tree, which is usually compared with the complexity of uh, New York Metro. Okay, so if you see, this is like a very complex tree. There are several kinases, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, about 500 kinases. But there are, they, they are classified into two different broad areas. One is serine threonine kinases, kinases, another one is tyrosine kinases. Depends on which amino acids this kinase phosphorylate. And they play a very important role in many of the signaling pathways. I'll come to their importance. The signal, as I said, a lot of signaling pathway, gene transcription and translation, oncogene response, membrane transport, and cell cycle regulation. So if we take any part of a cell where there is a lot of signaling is important, you can find any, any, any of these 500 kinases because they are very important in many human diseases, not only cancer, in case of autoimmune diseases, in case of some of the infectious diseases. So you can see in this figure, you can see the survival of the cell. There is a kinase involved. You see the proliferation of a cell. There is a kinase involved. If you see a DNA damage response, there are kinases involved. In angiogenesis, there are kinases involved. So this function of the kinases actually makes it as a very important target for cancer. So if you go very close to a kinase structure, this is a a very simple form of a kinase uh, structure cartoon. You can see there is a there are two lobes in the kinase, and then there is a hinge region. As you can see, this is an N-terminal lobe, and this is a T-terminal lobe. 
and you see a hinge region where the ATP goes and binds. The hydrophobic part of uh, part of the region binds to this um, adenine uh, part, and the hydrophilic region binds to the phosphate part. So this is a this is a very simple way of depicting a kinase. So why this kinase drug discovery has become so important uh, after this very magic compound called Imaginib, which was developed uh, in the lab and then become a first targeted therapy for uh, CML. So it has become a, a billion dollar uh, drug after its discovery. And these three gentlemen actually got this prize for uh, discovering this molecule and developing this molecule. So this actually uh, opened up a lot of venue for um, making a targeted therapy. So if you make a targeted uh, molecule for a specific kinase, that could become a targeted therapy. So if you go very close to imatinib and the mechanism of imatinib, how this binds to a BCR able, which is a kinase, it is, uh, it is a kinase inhibitor as it was it is developed. And you can see here, the imatinib binds to the ATP binding pocket. So this is a competitive inhibitor. When I say competitive inhibitors, ATP is a substrate for a kinase and imatinib goes and binds to this pocket and that is why it is a competitive inhibitor. And it was a pretty potent binding which uh, the imatinib actually exhibits. As you can see here, it binds very, very nicely to the ATP binding pocket and it doesn't let the ATP to bind. So that is how there is no signaling uh, downstream of this uh, kinase. So the um, cancer actually has been reduced or the, the patients were uh, able to get treated much more effectively. So there are a lot of structural um, implications that, is, that has come out after this imaginative co-bound structure with the BCR able. This also paved a way to develop more potent inhibitors when imatinib actually become resistance to this particular uh, kinase. So you can see this was uh, developed for CML and desertinib which has developed for imatinib resistant BCR able mutants and then elotinib was also developed later on. So all of this is for CML and as you can see here in my in the below slides the gifetinib and other molecules were also developed for non-small cell lung cancer. So if you see um, in February, I think end of February, uh, Professor Gray, who is a pioneer in kinase inhibitors and kinase drug discovery, has uh, published a fantastic paper on ACS Central Science, where he has uh, really discussed the importance of covalent inhibitors and uh, double bar head inhibitors, which are coming up in a really, really nice manner. So if you see a kinase, I said that there are two lobes. And if you want to particularly uh, target the cysteine, with a warhead, which is a small molecule, it could be a uh, reversible inhibitor in the beginning, but it also could become a covalent inhibitor. So these warheads are typically a very small portion that is attached to the particular uh, small molecule that is developed as a, as a kinase inhibitor. So most of the time they had acrylamide uh, type of a derivative um, so that they can actually go and bind to this uh, cysteine moiety. And this is the beauty of this chemistry that happens actually in vivo, and it makes this molecule very, very uh, potent molecule to, um, to be an inhibitor for a kinase. So these are the FDA approved covalent kinase inhibitors. Uh, there are many more, but these are the ones which are developed and uh, they have also got a specific a special um, approval for the fast track inhibitors. So if I take the history and the timeline of approved kinase inhibitors for last 20-25 uh, years, as you can see here, the first one was the ROC inhibitor, which was developed in 1995. And now by this time of, by, by the time that we are talking, and there are several, several inhibitors which are developed as a kinase inhibitors, which are FDA approved drugs for different types of cancer, not only for cancer, different types of other autoimmune diseases and infectious diseases also. So, but there are several challenges in this uh, kinase inhibitors uh, when you want to make them as a drug. The first one is that, as I told you, there are 500 plus kinases. So they have a very highly conserved ATP binding region 
So the selectivity becomes a kind of a problem. So even in case of imatinib, imatinib was not inhibiting only BCR able, it was inhibiting the other kinases also. Okay, so and then that's that's one of the limitations. So and the binding pocket where these small molecules go and mind, uh, bind, there's always a chance of the mutation happens. So the drug resistance is another problem. So and the toxicities attached to the off-target effects of these kinases like cardiotoxicity and hypertension. But with the with the with the proteomics, genomics, and all the structural biology tools that have developed in the last 10 years, there are chances where we can improve this kinase drug discovery by targeting a different site in the kinase um, uh, pocket, which could be an allosteric pocket, where we can develop non-competitive ATP inhibitors and then covalent inhibitors, as I mentioned. And then you can use something called synthetic lethality. It's a, it's a very important concept in DNA damage as well as in other pathways of cell signaling, which I will come uh, in few slides. And then monitoring these cancer biomarkers and target um, the drug-resistant kinase mutants. So these are the scopes that we can still improve the kinase drug discovery. And then it, it is still it's still a very happening uh, target for uh, cancer. So um, as I mentioned in my last slide, there is only a small portion of kinases which have been tar successfully targeted. Why? Because again, half-target effects will have a lot of toxicity related to it. And the reactivity with the other kinases, if you make a molecule for one kinase, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that it will only go and bind to this only this kinase. So other kinases will also be targeted. And then depends on the importance of that kinase in a normal cell versus cancer cell makes a very big difference. Okay, so and then I, as I told you, acrylamide warheads are the only, uh, they are the only ones till now most frequently used. So we need to figure out for other type of molecules which where you can make um, uh, covalent inhibitors. So our lab works on something called DNA uh, damage uh, sensing kinases. This is our uh, major interest. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, two important kinases where we have been working for last 10 years. ATR and ATM uh, and ATR ATM and TLK. So why these kinases are very important? So any therapy um, in cancer, uh, if when you are doing either a radiotherapy or a chemotherapy, that induces uh, DNA damage. So this DNA damage could be single strand or double strand. So when the DNA damage happens in normal cells, there are these kinases will come and then rescue this DNA damage, rescue the cells by repairing this. Um, DNA and put the DNA back into the normal state. But once the DNA is not repaired, that actually goes to the cell death. So if you are able to inhibit any of this DNA damage and repair pathway in cancer cells specifically, then that's a very, uh, very nice combinatorial method along with chemotherapy or radiotherapy to see that you can specifically target these kinases um, for a cancer therapy. So our strategy, we uh, design and develop for targeting this uh, DDR kinases. And these DDR kinases are either not commercially available or their structure is not still known very well. So when we started the lab, that was a very big challenge that we didn't have ATR, ATM or TLK for that matter. Those kinases were not structurally studied very well. Um, so that was a big challenge. So we have to, we have, uh, we have started that recombinantly. We express these kinases in E. coli and start purifying them, so that we can use the, uh, uh, basically we can make some kinase assays with the molecules that we are designing and synthesizing. So to develop, because these these are not known. Again, we have to develop, um, design and develop a very good biochemical assays and cellular assays for studying these kinases specifically. And then eventually we wanted to also to do the structural studies of these molecules to see exactly where these small molecules are interacting with this protein. So first, um, we have just started with this ATR kinase. Um, I'll quickly introduce how ATR kinase is important. Um, so as I told you that when DNA damage happens, a single strand or a double strand, um, ATM and ATR will come to rescue the DNA. So they have this downstream substrates like check two for ATM and uh, check one for ATR. So this is very important uh, pathway because once the DNA is damaged, either it, uh, the cells will go to apoptosis or if the repair is not done correctly, then it probably will go into some mutational uh, changes also. 
So in specific cancer, there's something called that I mentioned in my uh, previous slides, a synthetic lethality, where some cancers don't have this particular gene ATM, where the, the entire cell signaling pathway depends on this only ATR pathway. So if in those specific cells, now those specific cancers, if we target ATR, ATR by developing inhibitors specifically for ATR, because it doesn't have ATM, the cell has to uh, go to cell death. Okay, so this is one of the strategy that is used here in our lab also. So this is the extension of the previous slide. So once the DNA damage happens, either by um, ionizing radiation or UV or small molecules, then this is a pathway that it will take. So as I mentioned, why ATR ATM? Um, in the previous slides, I told you in normal cells, you have both the pathways, which is ATR and ATM. Uh, but once it actually, when there is some kind of a precancerous stage or the cells which are in the, which are in the tumoric uh, nature, so where one pathway is not there, so some of the uh, uh, inhibitors that we have developed and uh, tested is against uh, one particular type of cancer, which I'll tell you later. So this targeting one uh, important pathway will automatically shut, uh, because that, uh, the other pathway is not there, will automatically put the molecule, put the cells into cell death. So this is called exploiting synthetic lethality. So we, when we started the lab, there was an inhibitor which was developed in uh, Professor Gray and Professor Sabatini lab at MIT and Harvard. This is called TORIN2, which was developed as an mTOR inhibitor. But through kinase profiling and kinase screening, this molecule also um, actually targeted uh, two or three uh, DNA damage pathway kinases. One of them was the ATR, ATM, DNA, PK, and some of the PIK3 kinases, uh, this molecule was actually inhibiting. So we picked up the scaffold from Torin 2 and then modeled on top of mTOR. So around 2014 or 15, mTOR cryo-EM structure was uh, published. So we took that as a model built, um, and then this is this is where my lab started. And my first uh, PhD students, um, Dr. Altaf joined my lab, and uh, another PhD student from biology, uh, Dr. Rashmi joined. So both of them actually took this project of um, developing a small molecule for ATR. So as you can see here, we did docking, and then we screened a lot of molecules, small molecules for this. And then we came up with the chemical modifications of this particular analog. So where you can see here, this molecule in the beginning, it was inhibiting ATM, ATR, mTOR, and uh, PA3 kinases, family of kinases. And uh, so we, we, as you can see here, we did a very small modification of putting an extra piprazine ring here. Um, and that actually made the molecule more selective towards ATR. I'll tell you how, uh, how it has been done. So these are the, the top portions of the first uh, generation of ATR inhibitors that was made by Altaf. And, uh, and, and then this, the other portions are the second generation of inhibitors. So we made almost about 130 molecules. I'm not uh, going to the details of the synthesis because these are all published work from our lab. So, um, so this is like, this is definitely the bread and butter of the lab because we first have to make these molecules. And Altaf could able to successfully make a lot of molecules of this series. Um, and these are the two synthetic schemes. Again, it's published, so everybody can go and take a look at the literature. Um, so once we have the molecules, but we need, we didn't have the protein. As I said, that was not commercially available. And uh, Rashmi actually tried to express ATR kinase domain, just a kinase domain in E. coli for a very, very, very long time. So I think we have failed so many times and we were almost about to uh, about to lose hope that we will not be able to uh, express kinase. But Rashmi is extremely hardworking as well as uh, intelligent student. So she somehow pulled off expressing this ATR kinase domain. Um, that's uh, that's like the, I think that's that's very very important for any PhD student or any student who are in research to have some kind of a patience. So some, finally it will work out. So she could able to purify it. She could able to purify it very actively. We have got a very active protein, and then we developed all the kinase assays of ATR, which was one of the first um, uh, reports of uh, expressing ATR kinase in an E. coli. So as I told you, basically I'm a chemist. So the, the biology that has been done in the lab has been only from my students and their knowledge has been only translated to me now. 
So this is uh, when we published this first paper in biochemistry. I, I understand that's one of the most toughest biology journal to publish in ACS. Um, so one of the editors, Michael Sedman, wrote to us uh, saying that it's one of the best papers uh, in recent years. So which is which is kind of a very overwhelming um, response uh, from a from a very experienced and a very well known biologist. Um, so so this was done. So once we could able to actually do it. We quickly went and then did ATR assays uh, with this particular molecule, SPK98, uh, which is also developed in our lab. So we used HCT116 cell lines, where we treated these molecules with this molecule, with all these molecules. We have done this uh, for the screening. I'm just showing only 10 molecules here. But we have done the screening for several other molecules. Uh, and then we actually picked up the best molecules. As you can see here, 13 and 14 are the best molecules that, that, were, that came out of the screening. And then it's not only here, not only doing only um, that, uh, like it's an anti-cancer. So now, now if you, you cannot tell a molecule which is anti-cancerous, unless otherwise you show what is the target, what is the mechanism of the molecule. So we went ahead and then we wanted to see how the molecule will behave inside a cell. Okay, so you can see here, then the, when you treat our molecule, um, this is the normal mitosis. You can see nicely these chromosomes here. But when you treat our molecule and after the DNA damage, then this is called pre premature chromatin condensation, which is called PCC. So this is a very important phenomena that happens when ATR is um, inhibited. Okay, so through this way, we could able to prove that molecule SPK98 indeed binds to ATR and actually it induces PCC. This was a very, very important, uh, important milestone in our lab where we can develop a molecule in five years and uh, within five years and we can show in uh, some of the in vitro in, in vivo studies that this indeed is a specific inhibitor for ATR. And then um, another student, uh, Banu, who is a biologist again in my lab. So she has developed this assay uh, where um, sometimes COVID also helped us to be very patient, right? So during COVID time, she has developed a lot of uh, stable cell lines. One was at ATM uh, knockdown cell lines. Um, as I told you that within ATM knockdown cell lines, this ATR inhibition should have a major effect. As you can see here quickly, um, the wild type um, IC50 value or GA50 value is about 42 nanomolar. But in, in terms of ATM knockdown cell lines, the IC50 considerably reduced to 10 nanomolar. So this shows that importance of the synthetic lethality where you have a molecule which inhibits to one of these proteins which is synthetically lethal to the other protein. So when we were doing this work and when we were also having a lot of failures in ATR kinase, um, there was a new paper published uh, by Professor Benedetti where he introduced a kinase called TLK1, uh, 1 and 1B, uh, which was uh, proved to be very, very important in um, DNA repair as well as in uh, prostate cancer. So as I told you in the previous slides, how important is DNA damage? Here TLK1B also is important in DNA damage. but but here you can see these three substrates, uh, which is phosphorylated by TLK1B. But when we started this work in 2015, we didn't know any of the substrate. There was only one substrate, uh, which is known to be phosphorylated by TLK1B, histone. And other than that, we didn't know much about this uh, uh, kinase. But the papers published around this kinase showed its importance in prostate cancer, as well as showed importance in the DNA repair and uh, repair pathway. So we wanted to take this as a challenge because even though ATR ATM has been there for a very, very long time, um, this, this was a very small kinase. We thought maybe we can use our strategy of expressing this kinase uh, would work. And meanwhile, this, as I told you that there is, um, this kinase is very important in prostate cancer. So we wanted to check having this TLK inhibitor um, as a as a therapy uh, along with the uh, baclotamide, which is uh, which is a known uh, FDA approved uh, drug for prostate cancer. So in that paper in two thousand thirteen, Professor Benedetti has published a few inhibitors uh, which are structurally and chemically very similar to phenothiazine scaffolds. But the advantage or disadvantage disadvantage with phenothiazine scaffolds are they are antipsychotics. Okay, so as you can see here, this molecule, all of this molecule, this uh, moiety is called phenothiazine moiety. So we wanted to generate some molecules with the phenothiazine moiety, 
but we want to um, get rid of this antipsychotic effect you know so by replacing this particular c2 substitution uh, made uh, could probably will not have any antipsychotic effect so we developed quickly about 10 or 15 molecules which are imp which are which are which are easy to make it's not very difficult to make because uh, phenothiazine scaffold synthesis is already very well known but the only uh, challenge was whether these molecules will react uh, towards TLK as well as this molecule, will, will it be very uh, effective for prostate cancer? So as again chemist, Javina, my uh, PhD student, started making these uh, molecules as a library. So she made about, uh, about 25 molecules, the first series, uh, as the first generation of molecules. And meanwhile, so we made these molecules where we removed the C2 position to decrease the antipsychotic effect. And also we increased the, uh, we also had this alkyl length to be uh, kept in the first generation. But now we have third generation of molecules where I'll show you in the uh, coming slides how we have generated those molecules. So though I'm just skipping this most of the chemistry part, but these are the most important part in our lab where we could able to develop several uh, varieties of molecules, several scaffold of the molecules, so that if the first generation molecule fails, we were always ready to have the second generation of molecules going to the next trials. So um, that time, another PhD student, Siddhant, has joined the lab, and he's again a biologist. So Siddhant could be able to um, make use of uh, several other failures that uh, that Rashmi had it on her on her ATR project. But one of the uh, very nice uh, strategy that didn't work for ATR actually worked for uh, TLK. So he could able to uh, recombinantly make this TLK protein uh, with a very high purity as well as very high uh, yield. So we have got almost 10 mix per ml, which is a very, very high. So we quickly did the bioactivity and they were, it was very active. So when I say bioactivity for chemists, I'm saying that if uh, kinase is produced in E. coli body or in mammalian cells, there is always a chance that the kinase gets phosphorylated, which is called a transphosphorylation. So it can get phosphorylated by other uh, kinases. Uh, so, to, uh, so getting this uh, kinase very pure without phosphorylation is a, is a big challenge that we could be able to do it in the lab. And then since we had the kinase, we had the molecules, we went and screened these molecules. Okay, so we've got one, uh, one or two hits from this uh, molecule and then we went ahead with the so that is the first paper when we published and the professor benedetti probably was one of the reviewers of the paper so he was very interested to work with us um, and uh, siddhan got a fulbright fellowship so he went to his lab and uh, you can see here um, in fifth so i will just take a couple of minutes to uh, go through this um, slides um, as you can see here this is a control this is biclotamide which is fda approved drug for prostate cancer this is j54 which is the molecule that is shown here, which is developed by Javina. And this is a combination of biclotamide J54. As you can see here in controlled prostate, you can see that cancer is still there. Biclotamide is reduced. J54, it is even more reduced. But in case of combination of uh, J54 and biclotamide, you can see this complete reduction of uh, the prostate cancer. And this is done in 51 days. So it's such an amazing uh, results that we have got and we were very excited to see um, how to develop because uh, it is not that a molecule inhibits in that potency uh, will be, so drug discovery is different when a molecule has to go to a drug level. It is It has to cross a lot of other uh, phenomena like it's PKPD and all of this. So, but an animal model, we could be able to prove that the first generation of molecules of phenothiazine were extremely good. And we also did complementary uh, uh, assays to show that that molecule doesn't possess any antipsychotic effect. So, encouraged by those results, and we have designed the second and third generation of molecules. As you can see here, this is done by uh, another PhD student from chemistry, Delna. But Delna is both chemistry as well as half biologist because she only expresses the protein and she also studies the molecules. So uh, the beauty of chemistry here is very clearly seen. You can see here the J54 has uh, CH2CH2 here. And the molecule 12 has an extra oxygen here. Just by adding this extra oxygen either here or towards in sulfur, you can see the molecule has binding to the hinge region much more effectively. 
So this shows that adding a hydrogen bond donor or acceptor in a molecule actually makes a lot of difference. And this these generation of molecules shown to be much more effective and much more potent. By this time, uh, we have also got this NIC, uh, NIC1 um, is another kinase, which is phosphorylated by uh, TLK. So we are now studying these molecules uh, with the assays developed in our lab. So this is that's, this is what I was explaining that additional carbonyl functional group um, either uh, to make it is here or either on the sulfur is actually very helpful to binding. So when while we are doing this, um, Bhanu, another PhD student, she actually wanted to study um, this TLK, okay, TLK in glioblastoma because TLK uh, was known for prostate cancer. Uh, but TLK is not very well known for glioblastoma importance, importance in glioblastoma. So the conventional treatment of glioblastoma, as you can see here, is a tumor resection and temozolamide is the drug, FDA, drug, uh, FDA drug, uh, approved drug. And uh, that is the only treatment right now available. So if recent literature showed that TLK is very much upregulated in glioblastoma. So we wanted to make use of this and see whether this particular TLK uh, since we have the TLK kinase in the lab, we have the molecules uh, made for specific uh, binding for TLK. So we want to see whether we can specifically target glioblastoma. So we quickly did uh, some studies. These are very, very preliminary studies, as you can see here. So in this LN229 cells, where you can see that the J54 and temozolamide combination is working beautifully well. And this is a very uh, data high slide. So I'll take a couple of minutes. So you can see that it J54 induces DNA damage and cell death along with the temozolomide, which is actually seen in many of these um, assays. So I can I, I think all of you can see the slides. As you can see, this cell, cell it prevents cell migration. Um, it also has a very good um, a DNA damage and the cell death. So these are all uh, the preliminary results that we have got in glioblastoma. So while doing uh, all of this work, so we could able to figure out there is an another kinase, uh, which is also hit by J54. So we are going to going towards this kinase now. So what I really want to tell you in summary uh, of what we are doing in our lab is um, a library of small molecules for DDR kinases is actually generated in our lab. And I'll be very happy to help to study these kinases with our small molecules. And we have expressed, right now we have a lot of panel of kinases expressed in-house. Uh, and the first report of TLK kinase expression studies were done here. And we have also done the selectivity profile over other kinases. And uh, the mechanism, mechanism of inhibition is uh, established for ATR, uh, ATR and uh, um, TLK kinase. Uh, we have molecules of J54 scaffold and also the next generation with a very good pharmacokinetic profile. So we are taking it uh, for the for, for further studies. So the preliminary animal models of, um, of prostate cancer with the J54 uh, shows very promising results. So we have to progress in that area also. And uh, similarly, um, we are working with Professor Somasundaram from IIC Bangalore to develop uh, glioblastoma models for uh, where TLK is highly expressed and see whether our molecules would probably be helpful uh, for any kind of a combinatorial treatment. So all this kinases, uh, the structure is still unavailable and we are also progressing towards uh, uh, having this uh, either cryo-EM or extra structure of these, these bigger kinases and also TLK1B uh, with the Professor Vijay Tirvengatam lab in IIT Gandhinagar. So in conclusion, I would like to um, just say that the kinesis actually has a very rich landscape for drug discovery. It offers immense potential for developing targeted therapies across the spectrum of diseases, not only cancer. Um, as I told you, the only challenge would be that uh, the selectivity, but that also can be overcome if you have a very um, uh, organized way of uh, structure-based drug design. 
and uh, there are a lot of um, do a lot of challenges there are a lot of improvements in all the fields of uh, proteomics and uh, other techniques of biology so which will help to elucidate this kinase biology and also uh, have innovative drug discovery strategies uh, which will have a future breakthrough in precision medicine as as you can see here as you can you have seen imagine um, how well it was received and uh, how important its discovery. So similarly, there are a lot of molecules which probably can have a lot of breakthrough in future if they are developed in a uh, very organized manner for, uh, for uh, as a drug discovery project.